Our marriage awakened the moment my husband quit working and stopped providing stability for the family. A friend my age had the same situation. After a couple of years of working five-hour-a-week part-time jobs, his life and marriage started to unravel. His wife was constantly burdened. She wanted to have kids but didn't see how that was possible, with him contributing so little to the family's well-being. That makes sense to me. If I were a girl, a dangerous way to start a sentence. Why would I expect you to be a committed, attentive, dedicated father if you couldn't dedicate yourself to something as simple as a day job? If humanity's chief needs include security and stability, and you're not actively contributing to either, why would I trust you with another life, let alone my own? This wasn't an idea I invented. Thousands of people have written about the need and purpose of work in our lives. Actor Ryan Gosling dealt with this after the success of the movie The Notebook. To combat the sense of drifting aimlessly, he got a job making sandwiches at a deli. When asked about it in an interview, he said, The problem with Hollywood is that nobody works. They have meals. They go to Pilates. But it's not enough. So they do drugs. If everybody had a pile of rocks in their backyard and spent every day moving them from one side of the yard to the other, it would be a much happier place. We need to work. And though I feel like I'm stepping on Oprah's toes here, if a guy or girl you're dating is lazy and jobless, chances are marriage is not going to jumpstart things. Having a baby doesn't jumpstart a marriage. Getting married doesn't jumpstart a relationship. Quitting a job doesn't jumpstart a dream because dreams take planning, purpose, and progress to succeed. That stuff has to happen before you quit your day job. Often it should occur months and even years before. You've probably heard the axiom, success always comes when preparation meets opportunity. It's true. And the opportunity to quit your job will always be there. The real question is whether you've prepared. Figuring it all out as you go is not a plan. Escaping imperfect circumstances is not a purpose. Quitting your job because it feels right is not progress. It's precisely the opposite. Want to demonstrate love for your spouse or significant other? Keep your day job while you chase your dream job. Want to learn how to be dedicated and focused on your dream? Practice being dedicated and focused at work. Want to give your dream the best shot of success? Learn how to be successful at work. We often demonize our day jobs when we dream. We make them enemies of what we really want to do. But if you dream the right way and learn to quit the right way, your day job can actually be your dream job's greatest ally. One last word about quitting your job, because maybe you should. Initially, I was tempted to slam this chapter somewhere in the middle of the book. My fear was that the casual reader, the girl at Urban Outfitters with a really complicated scarf, might be turned off by having the first chapter in a book about chasing your dreams begin with the assertion, don't quit your job. I understand that, I do. It's common for dream-following books to start with encouraging chapters like Your dream is only one step away or Dare to believe and it will all come true. And that's fine. There's a place for that, I guess. I just didn't think that place was the beginning of this book. Despite my extensive history of job quitting and the advice of scores of people, I didn't quit my day job at autotrader.com for three years. That probably doesn't seem like a long time to you, but to me... It is the equivalent of a 21-year career. During this tenure, I started a blog that is read in 97% of the countries in the world. I wrote a book. I sold that book to more people than 95% of all authors do. I built two kindergartens in Vietnam. I was offered an additional two-book deal from one of the biggest publishers in the world, and I keynoted at conferences across the country. Most of it would have been impossible without a day job that allowed me to duck the dawns keep my nose, stay dangerous, and stabilize my marriage. But eventually, I did quit my day job for something else. Something crazy. And I think you might too. But before you do, we need to kill some popular but precarious lies about quitting. Chapter 2. Removing the I'm from your butt. We love goodbyes. I've never attended a steadfast obedience party at work. I've never been invited to a staying put get-together. I've never heard of a sticking around forever shindig. And I haven't for one simple reason. 
We live in a corporate culture that celebrates people who leave and ignores those who stay. I don't blame them. There is something inherently sexy about quitting your job. You conjure up adventures and goatees and close calls in foreign lands with girls whose names have an attractive number of vowels. You can't help but think about the potential life someone will find out there in the wide world. We get really drunk on the idea of what might be. We ignore what already is. We don't notice the person who comes in every day, tirelessly handling key components of a business week after week. We get starry-eyed about the adventure someone will inevitably have when he quits the same company. Think of the opportunities. Think of the dream. These are the things we exclaim at going away parties held in our offices while eating mediocre grocery store cake. I remember the last time I attended a going away party for a girl I knew. After nearly ten years of loyal service, she was quitting. In our city, she was one of the highest paid in her field. She still had a lot of runway ahead of her. She was quitting anyway. It was her last day, and we were all there to talk about her. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone told her. I'm so proud of you for following your dream and stepping out in courage. Over and over, we lauded this girl with envy at her boldness, as if only cowards would stay at their jobs. We are so ashamed that we didn't have the guts to follow in her footsteps. Take these broken wings and learn to fly again. Learn to live so free. No one made a peep about doubting her decision. No one said the I word, impulsive. She was the emperor in brightly colored quitting clothes, and who were we to tell her otherwise? Worse still, she didn't even have another job or another plan to make money. She simply quit to follow a fuzzy feeling she had in her heart. We didn't care. She was our hero. Labeling quitters automatic winners, coupled with the ready demonization of our jobs we talked about in chapter one, has had an interesting effect on us. It has turned us. Into the I'm but generation. We don't know what we want, but this isn't it. When I speak to people online or in person, we inevitably end up talking about what they do. Hundreds, if not thousands, of times, I find one thread of consistency in the explanations I hear. People say, "I'm a teacher, but I want to be an artist. I'm an accountant, but I want to be a therapist. I'm a project manager." But I want to start my own company. At first, I was surprised by this because I think the perception is that if you're unhappy at work, you must not know what you want to do. If you're not in love with your current job, you must not know how to finish the "I'm a blank, but want to be a blank" assertion. But that isn't what I found to be true. If anything, most of us have at least a blurry definition of what we'd like to do if we could. No one ever told me, "I'm a pharmacist." But I have no idea what I want to be. Absolutely zero idea, really. Never had a dream. Never had a desire. Never had something that made me feel alive. I am a blank canvas of misery in the pharmacy where I work. No, there was always at least a hint of some other desire, a dream or expectation for life. I don't think we're confused about what we want to be when we grow up. We might not be able to say, "I want to become a CPA and open my own business on 10th Street in Cleveland, Ohio, in March of 2014." But for the most part, we've had a glimpse of our dream job, and even if we don't know precisely what our thing is or our passion, there are plenty of ways to find out. For instance, according to the Myers Briggs Personality Assessment, I am an ENFP. That means I am into extroversion. Intuition, feeling, and perception. According to that personality test, those four letters indicate a lot about me. I'm friendly. I'm a global thinker. I like people, etc. My favorite part of the analysis, though, is the list of people who are also ENF peers. One site lists Sinbad and Bill Cosby as fellow ENF peers. Their one distinguishing credit for Cosby is that he was in Ghost Dad. Why didn't they mention that slightly popular series called The Cosby Show? Would you ever in your life describe Bill Cosby as that guy who was in that movie Ghost Dad? The best part of this web analysis is it also lists fictional ENF peers. Want to know who I am like? Balky from Perfect Strangers, Ariel from The Little Mermaid, and Urkel from Family Matters. Awesome. 
That is quite a motley crew. According to the DISC profiles rankings of 0 to 100, I scored 100 points on I and 0 points on C. I stands for influence, and C stands for conscientiousness. So I'll be able to convince you to do something, but you'll probably think I'm a jerk during the experience. I am also wildly different in my natural life, who I really am, and my adapted life, who I am in public. There is actually a 60-point gap between those two ratings, and considering it's a 100-point scale, that is troubling. According to another test, I am an ideation guy. A different one rated me as a otter. A Christian test said that I am a Jacob. There is no shortage of personality tests and job tests out on the market, and I have taken a lot of them. Some are great and deeply inform you about some questions you might have about your life. Some feel a little fluffy, like a fortune teller who asks broad questions and gives you even broader answers. That is why I am a little hesitant to put a chapter in here about figuring out what your dream is. It would be easier if we all just knew. It would be easier if we came onto the planet with that written out clearly. That is not the case. If it were, I would have not been a horrible guitar player for about 30 minutes. That's how long I was willing to dedicate to the craft. I owned a Martin D1, which is an expensive, beautiful guitar, upon which I was able to play the opening to Every Rose Has Its Thorn by the band Poison. Perhaps you are familiar with this exquisite ballad. I was also a horrible painter for about 30 minutes. I thought that maybe what I wanted to do was paint. So I took an accomplished local painter to an art store. She encouraged me to spend $200 on really fancy paints. Then I went home, sat in the yard, and painted a still life of a Diet Coke can. Then I quit. I was a horrible runner for about 2 hours and 39 minutes. That's how long it took me to run a half marathon. I thought maybe I could be a runner, shave my legs, get all skinny, and own yellow sneakers. Only really fast or crazy people are allowed to own yellow running sneakers. I was going to do it this time, for real. I was going to be a runner, but after my first race, I spent an hour in the bathtub, finally being forced out by my wife, who was leaving to run errands and was concerned I would drown. I'm not a guitar player. I'm not a painter. I'm not a runner. I'm a writer. Something it took me decades to remember. Decades I don't want you to waste. Decades, I want you to enjoy doing what it is you want to do with your life. I'd much rather us figure it out, capture it, and get you started today than have you spin your wheels like me for so many years. So what do you want to do? I have exactly one idea about that question, but I think it is surprisingly enough. The 42-year-old beekeeper. Whenever you start trying to actively figure out what it is you want to do, Whenever you start to search for the thing that makes you come alive, something weird happens. You imagine you are going to discover it. You might not verbalize this, but inside, you start to think that when you finally land upon what it is you are supposed to be doing with your life, it will be a pleasant surprise. We all tend to view the process of finding our dream job like arriving at our own surprise birthday party. We imagine we will take a personality test arrive at the results, and be blown away, like we never saw it coming. Circus acrobat? Wow! And I'm an accountant. No wonder these years have been so hard. I should be in the circus. We think finding out what we want to do is going to be a revelation. In our 20s or 30s or 40s, we will stumble upon some activity we've never done, and like a kid tasting ice cream for the first time, we'll be hooked. Light bulb! Turns out we like beekeeping. Although we've always appreciated honey as a concept, and definitely in Cheerios, we've never had a fascination with queen bees and hives. But suddenly, we want to spend time around bees. A lot of time in a lot of weird suits with smoke and local farmers who have braids in their beards. That's what we believe about our dreams. But dreams rarely work that way. In his book, Start With Why, author Simon Sinek discusses this reality. He calls our dreams or calling, are why. He says, The why for every individual or organization comes from the past. It is born out of the upbringing and life experience of an individual. He further explains that finding why is not a process of invention. I agree with that, and I would take it one step further. 
I think finding your dream job, or what Senate calls your why, is more than a revelation or an act of discovery. I believe it's a process of recovery. More often than not, finding out what you love doing most is about recovering an old love or an inescapable truth that has been silenced for years, even decades. When you come to your dream job, your thing, it is rarely a first encounter. It's usually a reunion. So instead of setting out to discover the thing you love doing, you've got to change your thinking and set out to recover it, maybe even rescue it. Why? Because somehow you lost it along the way. I think this happens for a few reasons. For one thing, you might not have been ready for it the first time around. I once heard Bono tell Bill Hybels in an interview that in the 80s, he and his wife visited Ethiopia and saw the tremendous need there firsthand. On the way home, he told his wife Allie, "We will never forget this." She responded, "You know we will because to carry this with you every day is too much." Bono reflected on that moment and said that despite that, we were both clear that at some point we would be called upon to revisit these questions that, in truth, were probably too big for our young minds. The young rising star was not ready to start his work with one, the charity organization, in 1985. He was not yet a philanthropist interacting with people like Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. He was an up-and-coming musician who needed to grow before he could actually step into his calling. Still, it was there, and in the 90s, he and his calling were reunited for good. Your dream might not be as extreme as Bono's, but like him, you may meet yours before you're ready to run after it. That's what happened to me with blogging. In 2001, before it was a verb, my friend Billy and I started a website that specialized in music interviews, book reviews, and pop culture. I ran it for a year and could have gotten in on the ground floor of that medium, but I wasn't ready to handle the commitment. It would be seven years later and multiple blogs before I could start stuff Christians like. By that time, I was better prepared. When 4,000 people showed up on day eight of its existence, I was able to handle an influx that would have wrecked me in 2001. Another thing that estranges us from our dreams is everyday distraction. Rarely is the distraction so large you notice it. I've never met someone who says, "I was unable to write my great American novel because my house burned down." Instead, I've met hundreds of people who tell me they've never written their books because they are too busy. When you are in college, it's easy to daydream what you'll be when you grow up. You have huge chunks of time for the pursuit of whatever, but the chunks turn to crumbs when you hit the real world. There are bills and babies and jobs. You've got a calendar that barks out marching orders and multiple email accounts to manicure each day. When life gets full, it's a shame that your dream is one of the first things to get lost in the fray. We stop painting in our spare time or designing on the weekends because it seems such a fruitless endeavor. What a silly way to spend our free time when we could be getting that much-deserved rest or that much-needed mall therapy. You and your dream lose touch, and then years or decades later, like that summer camp love September stole away, we bump into our dreams and that bittersweet beckoning. Oh, I remember you. Even then, some of us don't want to acknowledge the former feelings. We play dumb. This comes out in my own life when I try to write. The hardest part of writing for me is being honest. It's not that I want to lie. I don't set out that way. But if I'm not careful, I end up playing the role of a clever writer. Instead of writing something that is true of my own experience and helpful to others, my wife pointed this out when I wrote my first book. She read an early chapter, paused, and then confessed, "I think it's well written. It's just that the whole thing is a lie." That's not fun feedback to get at the kitchen table, but she was right. I wasn't writing the book I wanted to write. I was writing the book I thought I should write. I was sitting down and trying to copy the writing of other authors. I was writing Donald Miller's book or Tim Ferriss's book. Why? Because I had discounted my dream. I was afraid to give credence to those often frightening feelings that come with wanting something fervently. In a contrarian version of "The Grass Is Always Greener," we tend to discount the value, importance, and urgency of our own dreams. In a subtle form of self-preservation, we find ourselves rejecting compliments people give us for doing what we love. When someone notices we're good at something, We respond, "Oh, that—that's nothing. It's just something I like to do in my spare time." The soundtrack we play in our minds is that our gift is nothing. Our dream really isn't that meaningful. 
It is just a bit of gossamer we play with sometimes. Don't think twice about it. The longer you play this soundtrack, the easier it is to believe it, especially if someone who matters to you tells you that your dream doesn't matter. Teachers, bosses, sometimes even parents will tell you that you're not good enough to pursue a particular dream. The more we develop this muscle of doubt, the stronger it becomes. But the doubt is still a deception. When I gave this book to a friend to read, she told me a story from her own life, and she said that when she was young, she loved to dance. That was her favorite thing to do. And in the eighth grade, her mom pulled her aside and said, Hey, you know you're not going to be a rocket, right? Like, that's not where this is going. You understand that, right? And she was crushed, and she stopped dancing shortly after that. And I think sometimes when we take feedback from people like that, we act as if they can predict the future, as if they know everything that's going to happen in our lives. And so that's one of the, to me, one of the biggest wounds that we suffer when we try to dream is the words and the input from other people. And sometimes, even if it's well-meaning, it can shatter that tiny, small thing that's just starting to grow. If you recognize the deception, if you admit that there is a chance that you are good, perhaps even great at something, you should feel a little uncomfortable. Because if your gift is not nothing, that means it is something. And a gift that is something is always a little terrifying, for at least three reasons. Number one, nothing can't hurt you. If your gift is something, then the pull to explore it is always there. You are compelled, even if only by curiosity, to at least try. Maybe you won't jump off a cliff for this something, but your chances of getting hurt are dramatically greater from pursuing something than nudging up to nothing. Number two, nothing is comfortable. Call it the better the devil you know than the devil you don't know syndrome. We're familiar with the nothing lie. It feels like an old sweater at this point, and we like that. The unknowns of a dream are just too disconcerting. What evils might arise? We'd rather not find out. Number three, nothing is normal. People with somethings are weird. In his book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, A Corporate Fool's Guide to Surviving with Grace, Gordon McKenzie says that if you ask a room full of first graders, how many artists are there in the room? They all eagerly raise their hands. If you ask a room full of third graders, Only a third of the class raises their hands. Mackenzie laments, the higher the grade, the fewer children raise their hands. By the time I reached sixth grade, no more than one or two did so, and then only ever so slightly, guardedly, their eyes glancing from side to side uneasily, betraying a fear of being identified by the group as a closet artist. And it's not just art that we feel that way about. It's dreams, too. We are embarrassed to have big, unruly somethings and would much rather go with the flow and have a normal life like everyone else. Not at 30 or even 20 years old. We begin thinking this way at 11 or 12. So what do you do when you find yourself buying the nothing lie? You read this chapter and everything will be magically fixed. I wish that were the case. But you usually can't just eject a soundtrack of doubt or denial that's been playing for years. What you can do, and it's really the best place to start, is call the soundtrack what it really is, a lie. You might still hear it. You might put this book down and hear it louder than ever before. But a lie is still a lie. And a lie is no foundation on which to base your career decisions. Don't buy into the nothing lie. You wound yourself when someone compliments your gift and you reply, Oh, that's nothing. Your gift is never nothing. Regardless of what it can be, it is always something. And something is the perfect place to start. There is a deep, deep hope seated in the idea that finding a dream is an act of recovery. There is a huge worth the price of this entire book difference between trying to discover your something and trying to recover your something. When you ask the question, what do I want to do with my life? you should feel at least a little overwhelmed. There are a million possible answers to that question. Where do you begin? A sport I'm pretty good at? A hobby? A city where I'd like to live? Should I take a cooking class or a tango class? Should I go back to school and get a degree? Or just grow a really great garden? Of all the countless paths I could take, which one leads me home? It's exhausting. The question, what do I want to do with my life, is nearly impossible to answer confidently and concisely, and that's because it's a discovery question. 
you're really asking, how do I discover what I want to do with my life? That is a question that points you into the vast expanse of the entire universe for an answer. It might sound fun, but once you're there, it can quickly swallow you up. But if finding your dream is an act of recovery, that changes everything. You don't ask the bottomless, what do I want to do with my life? But instead, what have I done in my life that I love doing? Instead of a million different options from out there, you're suddenly left with a manageable handful of options from within your own experience. Instead of trying to hit your star to an endless black hole of options, you hit your ride on your rewarding past. Once you make this mental switch, you can immediately start combing through your history for hints that will reveal your something. My favorite way to do this is by looking for hinge moments. In search of the hinge. Mercedes-Benz had a problem. They had developed an incredibly expensive sports car. It was an SLR and it cost more than $400,000, or as I like to think of it, double my first house. Although the production run of this particular beast was fairly limited, they still wanted to make sure each one sold. In order to do that, every inch of the car needed to scream high-end performance. Every detail had to be perfectly matched to the power and luxury the car offered drivers. The engine had to be extraordinary. The doors needed to be gateways to an adventure, not just a matter of ingress into a car. The ignition had to be igniting. When you think about it, the way we start our cars has not changed all that dramatically over the years. Once we move beyond the arm-breaking cranks that were on the grills of Model Ts, little progress happened to the actual ignition. Miles per gallon, aerodynamics, heated seats and automatic doors... Almost every part of the car has gone through a revolution of design improvement, except for the ignition. It has essentially remained the same for decades. You put a key in, you turn it, the car turns on, you drive. But if the car in question is the Mercedes-Benz SLR, a standard ignition will not suffice. You can't go ordinary in an extraordinary vehicle. So Mercedes looked at some improvements that have been made in the last 20 years. Some drivers seem to really enjoy push-button ignitions. There's something inherently fun about pushing a button to start your car. But it's also fairly common at this point. You can get a push-button ignition in a Toyota Camry or a Honda Accord. It's not that special anymore. The first thing Mercedes did is relocate the ignition button. While other manufacturers tended to place it in the dashboard, Mercedes put it in the gear stick. Right away, that feels a little different. Now starting your car feels a little like turning on a video game. That's interesting, and a good start, but this is a $400,000 car. We have to move way beyond interesting. What Mercedes-Benz did next forever changed the way I look at my life. That is a big statement, but I assure you it is not an exaggeration. It literally rewired how I look at what it means to follow a dream and do the things you love in life. It turned my understanding of what it takes to recover what you want to do upside down. What did Mercedes-Benz do to the ignition button? They added a hinge. On top of the button, they put a small hinge that held a cover in place. In order to start the car, you had to first open the cover and then press down on the ignition button with your thumb. That simple hinge tapped into every scene in every movie where someone launches a missile. The Hunt for Red October, Crimson Tide, Top Gun, in any scene where the hero is about to launch an attack to vanquish a seemingly impossible foe, he must first open the cover and engage the hinge. Suddenly, with a simple hinge, Mercedes-Benz forever altered the experience of its car. When you got into the SLR, you weren't starting a car. You were launching a missile out of your garage. With an incredibly simple hinge, Mercedes imbued their vehicle with an undeniable amount of emotion and energy. I knew they understood what they had done when I saw their brochure for the SLR. It was only a few pages long, so they were only able to put photos and information about the most critical elements in it. On one page was a photo and explanation of the engine. It probably took years and millions of dollars to develop. On the other page, Mercedes put a close-up of the hinge. It probably cost $30. It might have only taken a few days to come to the conclusion to add it to the car. It was incredibly small and insignificant when taken out of context. But none of that mattered. None of that made a difference because the hinge was the most important part of that vehicle.
Sometimes we think we need a massive eureka moment to come to grips with who we want to be and what we want to do. We wait for the lightning strike that will completely redefine our lives and give us clear direction. But the truth is, the greatest impact tends to come from hinge moments. A hinge moment occurs when you're planning to do something standard and normal, something you've done many times before, like turn a key in the ignition. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, something, a small detail usually, hinges you in a different direction. A chance encounter at the grocery store, a stranger's random comment, one line in an article you read pushes you to a place you are not expecting to go. Two such occurrences come to mind from my own life. Mrs. Harris and my first book. When people ask me when I knew I wanted to be a writer, this is the moment to which I most consistently point back. While living in Ipswich, Massachusetts, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Harris, challenged me to write a book. I'm not sure why since the class was not writing books at the time. But regardless of the reason, she tasked me with writing a book, and that's exactly what I did. After school each afternoon, I wrote poetry on those brownish sheets of paper with the red and blue lines and mile-wide margins. The poems weren't great. I remember rhyming fall and tall an awful lot. We didn't sell any copies. I didn't walk away with a lightning strike moment in those cold New England afternoons spent dulling my pencil. But it felt true. Even at that age, it felt like something I really liked doing and something I just assumed everyone else liked to do. There's a natural feeling to the things we're called to that we often assume everyone else has. Nothing dramatic happened with that book, except Mrs. Harris did a few things with it. She laminated it. She bound it. She made me feel like I was a published author. That was monumental for me. She didn't tell me I was an author. Those words never left her mouth. She didn't write that on a note in the book. She simply put the book together and handed it to me. Suddenly, I was an author. The lamination sealed it, literally and metaphorically. It meant the world to me, and though I couldn't tell you about anything I wrote for the next five years, that was a flare sent up high in the sky of my childhood. That was the very first hinge moment when I can remember where I thought writing might be something I could do forever. My dad gets the mail. My dad never got the mail when I was a kid. Well, almost never. Because as a pastor who was trying to raise boys carefully, he had some sort of sixth sense when it came to the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. He could go a full 11 months and 29 days without getting the mail. But then on swimsuit issue day, he flashed on the scene like a phantom, grabbed the thing, and threw it in the trash before my brothers and I knew what had happened. That was one of the two times he got the mail. The other was my second hinge moment. We didn't talk about it at the time. We haven't talked about it in the last 20 years. But when I was a teenager, he did something that spoke again to that third grader who liked to write about trees. One night, he grabbed the mail and found me downstairs. He handed me a thick packet with a brown envelope attached. Unbeknownst to me, he'd sent away for a special kit on how to publish a book. I don't know if he paid for it or if it was just one of those things you could get for free because they wanted to sell you something. It didn't matter. Here was a thick, you are important to me, you could be a writer if you wanted to be, packet. I think he might have spoken three or four sentences about it, and then we never discussed it again. I opened it and was excited, but ultimately never followed through on it. I was a girl-obsessed, awkward teenage boy, and writing a book seemed difficult and time-consuming. But that moment was part of the fuel that made me feel like my first book was in fact possible. That moment was forever etched in my memory as something that supported my belief that I could actually do this thing called writing. My dad believed in me. My dad believed in me so much that he had a packet for professional writers sent to me. That was my second hinge moment, and I can still speak about it like it happened yesterday. A few questions to ask when interviewing hinge moments. Looking back on it, the Mrs. Harris poetry book in the third grade was a bit like a Hallmark movie of the week. There I was, living on the North Shore, Massachusetts, in a town that literally had a castle on the coast. My father was in seminary and painting houses to make ends meet. We didn't have a lot, but I did have my poetry, and that kept me warm on those New England winter nights when the dark seemed hungry and the snow merciless. That's a bit much. But the truth is, that hinge was not difficult to spot. Looking back on it, the idea that a teacher 